I usually don't bring my, uh, <clears throat> my phone to church, and I wish I had to take a picture of that children's moment. That was great. That was great. Thanks, Kate. Our second reading for the, today comes from the book of Acts. It's the story of how the Holy Spirit came to the Christian church. It can be found in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and it is on page 111 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles, and can also be found in the back of your bulletin. Let us listen for God's word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. Well, today is Pentecost, right? And in the Christian church, we remember how the Spirit was given to those first disciples and thus the church. Now, you might be wondering why so many Jews were in Jerusalem at the time. In the Jewish tradition, it was also called the Festival of Weeks, which was a harvest festival where people brought the first fruits of their harvest to offer to God. It was 50 days after Passover, hence Pentecost. Our Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. And today we encounter the disciples in Jerusalem and it is Pentecost and they're all praying and waiting. Now before he ascended into heaven, Jesus promised them that they would be given the gift of the Holy Spirit and they would be his witnesses. And so for now they are praying and waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. So what do you suppose the disciples thought the gift of the Holy Spirit would be like? What would it look like? Was it going to come on the wings of a snow white dove? Were they going to have a feel good kumbaya moment when the Holy Spirit came to them? I mean, do you suppose they had any idea about what was to occur in that room in Jerusalem while they were praying and waiting? Do you suppose they had any idea of the force and the power with which that Holy Spirit would come? 
in that room in Jerusalem where the disciples were praying and waiting, the Holy Spirit did come as promised. There was a rush of a violent wind, and I imagine it was the kind of wind that we experience, right, during a storm. And then tongues of fire rested on the heads of each of the people gathered in that room, and finally, finally they began to speak. And when they did, they were speaking in different languages, and yet everyone could understand what they were saying. I mean, could you imagine one of the disciples' Facebook posts about this, right? What do you think that you could say that would sound reasonable, right? Something like, I was just praying and waiting on the Lord, and, and suddenly the wind blew like a hurricane, and then I, I looked around, and everyone's head was on fire, but they weren't burned. And then I started speaking in Portuguese, even though I've never studied the language, and everyone understood me anyway. And, and Peter was over there speaking in German, and I understood him, and I was totally freaked out, but it was awesome, man. This has to be the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, onlookers in the street are tweeting, these disciples are drunk and it isn't even noon, right? So it occurred to me while I was preparing for this sermon that I'm much more comfortable with the Holy Spirit that we sing about in that, that we'll sing about in the song after the sermon, right? Spirit, spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calming, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, Stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. It's so nice, and it's pretty, and it's safe. But what has come to my attention this Pentecost, like no other, is that this is not how the Holy Spirit came to those first disciples. It wasn't a spirit of gentleness at all, but one of power and might. And there wasn't a gentle wind on the sea, but a strong gale force wind that had everyone hanging on for their dear lives. On Pentecost, I'm reminded that there is much more to the Holy Spirit than I have imagined. Yes, the Holy Spirit can be a great comfort to us and is a great comfort to us, but it is also the force that can push us into places we would not otherwise go. You know, the disciples were pretty content praying and waiting in that room in Jerusalem but when the Holy Spirit came with power and might, the disciples were still praying, but they were done waiting. They had been given a gift, and now it was their time to witness. Now it was their time to testify. They left that room, and they went out into the city streets and into the small towns and into the cities to preach and pray and to heal and to pray and to preach and teach and to pray. It all began with the Holy Spirit given to them at Pentecost. And Pentecost continues with the Holy Spirit being given to us still. Sometimes I think that we are still praying and waiting. Sometimes I think we'd rather not go outside these walls into the city streets to preach and to pray and to heal and to pray and to teach and to pray. I don't know about you, but the Holy Spirit that comes with the rushing wind and fire and, and speaking in tongues, it scares me a little. I really feel much more comfortable with the spirit of gentleness that stirs me from placidness not the Holy Spirit that blows through all my very good excuses and scatters them to the four corners of the world. So today, my friends, our time of waiting is over. We have been given a gift, and now is our time to witness. Now is our time to testify. Just like those very first disciples, we are called to go out into the world and proclaim the love and hope of Jesus Christ. We are called to live Pentecost lives every single day. Preacher and Professor Barbara Lumblad, I quoted her last week in my sermon as well, she recalled a story in one of her sermons how one congregation lives out Pentecost long after the actual day is over. She writes, a few years ago, I, I talked with a friend of mine who is a pastor in New England. How's your building program going, I asked. Oh, we ran out of money before we got to the worship space, she said. And I thought to myself, what could be more important than the worship space? But I kept my thoughts to myself. 
We renovated the basement, she said. You know, we have a shelter there for homeless men. We put in new showers and renovated the old kitchen. The basement was so drab and the showers, well, there was only one shower and it was lousy. On the Sunday before the shelter opened, the worship service began as usual in the sanctuary. And when it came time for communion, the people carried the bread and the cup downstairs to the basement. The whole congregation gathered around the empty beds and they passed the bread and the cup around the circle, the body of Christ given for you. That night the shelter beds were full and the worship space still needed a lot of work. The church calendar said it was the first Sunday of Advent. But people in that congregation knew that Pentecost wasn't over. Pentecost shaped their life together. Today is Pentecost. And after today, Pentecost will not be over. Pentecost shapes our life together every day. Whether the Holy Spirit comes as a gentle breeze or a gale force wind, we are called to go out into the world and share what we know. And what do we know? We know that God loves us more than we can imagine. God loves everyone more than we can imagine. We are called to reach out so that others might find hope and healing and life that God offers in Jesus Christ. So when we realize the gift we have been given by the Holy Spirit, and when we witness to the power of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, Pentecost isn't over. May we let Pentecost shape our life together, not just today, but every day. Amen.